there we go. Hello, everyone. I'm Jason Bellini with Bloomberg Television. I'm uh, based in Singapore, and I have the honor of leading this panel today called Hidden Financial Lives, Driving Inclusion and Equitable Growth. What does that mean exactly? Well, we're going to find out from our distinguished panelists, who I'll introduce you to in just a moment. But the theme here is financial empowerment through technology, empowering the poor. I just did a story related to that uh, here in India, where I got to see firsthand how cell phone technology, cellular technology, is being used for banking and for microfinance. And as we get started, to kind of get us into the spirit, I'm going to play for you a very popular YouTube video. This is from M Pesa in Kenya. This is a service that was created to be a banking system over cell phones or to be a microfinance system, and it was adopted by people to use as their primary mode of transferring money around. So let's take a look at this. Now, you can send PESA fast and safe using Safaricom's new service, M-PESA. It is the new reliable way to send and receive money using your mobile phone. Visit your nearest M-PESA agent today. Terms and conditions apply. All right. So that's M-PESA in Kenya. We're going to learn a lot more about what's going on here in India, and I'd like to now begin introducing our panelists and ask each of them to just make a, a few brief remarks after I introduce you. Tell us a little bit more about what you do and your perspective on this issue. I'm going to begin, begin with Sachin Pilot, the Minister of State for Communications and Information Technology. Thank you, sir, for being here. Thank you very much. Good afternoon to all of you. Uh, I think the topic for today's uh, discussion inclusion and equitable growth. Uh, it's certainly one of the things that the government has very seriously been pushing uh, for the last six months and, and even before that. But to my mind, uh, how things have evolved, especially in the ministry that I am working in, the Ministry for Telecommunications and IT, uh, I think it's one benefit that one wasn't conceived when we were trying to proliferate mobile phones into rural parts of our, end, of our country. And what has happened now is that we have the infrastructure in place to be able to penetrate the kind of people who were not earlier targeted as being uh, stakeholders in our, in our financial markets. So we have today about 188 million people who have mobile phones but have no access to credit or to banking services. So the endeavor really is to somehow enhance the footprint of the financial services sector. And I think this can be a very good catalyst uh, our mobile telephony uh, and the kind of footprint that we have now had. So uh, mobile services, telecommunication services, and information communication technologies, uh, th as the convergence happens, it becomes very, very easy for government and for private sector to penetrate that market. And uh, the prime minister has been very clear and very candid about the kind of efforts he wants to see this government make in making sure that there is uh, equitable growth, financial inclusion, uh, I think it's unacceptable in a country like this, in India, where we have 10, 12, 13 million mobile phone connections every month, where the GDP is northwards of 6 to 7%, to have such a large portion of our population excluded from the banking sector, from the finance sector, from the insurance sectors. So we are really making sure that all the ministries work together, to make sure that we are able to achieve um, uh, the kind of uh, ideal situation where we have every part of our uh, country, whether it's geographical or socially, deprived sections uh, to become stakeholders in our collective financial growth moving forward. Minister, thank you. thank you. Sitting right next to me, Kamal Kadir, a social entrepreneur who was the recipient of the Tech Award for Applying Technology and Benefiting Humanity in 2007. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I run a uh, technology company 
which allows mobile phone, uh, millions of mobile phone users buy and sell basic commodities using mobile phone. Uh, it's like an eBay type organization. Now, um, we started when there was no uh, regulatory regime for uh, mobile money. In absence of uh, uh, money trans transfer, we created a platform where people would be able to post whatever they want to sell, and, and in, in response, people, will, uh, people who are trying to buy those products will contact them. Now, we uh, launched this service uh, in, in, in Bangladesh, taking an MIT technology over there. But what, what we realized that within, within three years, around 3.8 million users started using the service. And, and people might, be, um, might not have very high literacy over there, but people very quickly figured out how to, how to capitalize this resource and to improve their lives. So it's just an example that uh, even if uh, all the pieces are not there, people can uh, figure out solutions and use the tools appropriately if, if it is available to them. Thank you. Um, next, I'd like to introduce Sultan Ali Alana. He's the chairman of Habib Bank of Pakistan. Well, I had the board of, uh, of uh, one of the largest private sector banks in uh, Pakistan with over 1,400 branches spread across the country and with over 5 million customers, which we're very proud of. But of recent, when you look at the statistics of the penetration that the mobile networks have been able to achieve in emerging markets, the numbers are indeed very, very impressive. In the developed countries, just to give you a few numbers, in the developed countries, the uh, banking penetration is about 1.7 per adult, whereas in the emerging economies, the banking penetration is as low as 0.5 per adult. Now this varies, it goes down. In some countries, for example, such as Pakistan, it goes down to about 0.27. A country like Afghanistan, it goes down to maybe 0.1 per adult. On the flip side, if you look at the mobile penetration in these countries, the numbers are quite impressive. In a country like Pakistan, the mobile penetration is almost one per adult. And the numbers in Afghanistan are also not far behind. What this suggests is that the mobile uh, penetration in the markets, whether they are rural markets or urban markets, have been very impressive. And over the last 10 to 15 years, they've been able to achieve what the banking industry in these markets have not been able to achieve for decades. The challenge now is to examine the void and see how and what methodologies can be adopted to bridge the gap between people who've got the, tele who've got the cellular technology but do not have access to banking services. And is there a way that we can bring them closer to the banking network? Uh, hopefully, during the deliberations today, some of these aspects will come out and we'll talk a little more about it. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Next, we have Manoj Kohli, the CEO of Bharti Airtel India, the largest private mobile banking company, um, not mobile banking, private mobile company here in India. <laughs> it, it will be the largest mobile banking company of India and maybe the world. Okay, let me, let me first uh, start where uh, uh, my friend left. Let me introduce my company first. Uh, uh, my company has 115 million customers in India, mobile and fixed line and broadband. Uh, we cover uh, 430,000 villages and for more than 5,000 towns, which makes it about 83% of India's population. We are growing about 20,000, 30,000 uh, villages every quarter. Our objective, of course, is to cover the complete population of the country, which is 1.2 billion people. Uh, we also have 1.5 million retail points in the country, and by next year, we will take the retail points to 2 million, which means that actually uh, Airtel is available just around the corner, whether it's, your, it's close to your office or close to your home. And finally, we have a very secure last mile uh, capability, uh, which is secure in terms of technology and security. Now, let me also give you some statistics of Indian unbanked potential. Uh, less than 200 million people of India have bank accounts, unique bank accounts. 
which means that 85% of India, 80 to 85% of India does not, does not have bank accounts. Uh, banks will find it very difficult to cover because the cost of every transaction for a bank is 80 rupees. Cost of every transaction for ATM is 20 rupees. Cost of every call to bank call center is 15 rupees. And cost of an internet uh, transaction is 6 rupees. Which clearly means that each of these, these, these costs need to be overcome and minimized, like we have done in the mobile revolution. Today, mobile revolution touches about half a billion people. And we believe that before 2015, this revolution will actually touch 1 billion plus customers in India. So if this revolution has, 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 has done so well, why can't the mobile money transfer revolution follow this revolution? And why can't we make this phone as the mobile ATM with, with very affordable transaction cost? And actually, the issue is affordability of the transaction cost. Today, if mobile phone is touching half a billion in India, that's the only reason that we have touched. Uh, the, the only reason is the affordability. And same reason, I think we should apply to mobile banking. I, uh, there are 100 plus, 100 to 150 million migrant labor in India. We are doing a pilot, and Sachin, I just wanted to share with you, uh, pilot where uh, from Haryana, Kapaseda in Haryana, to Madhubani in Bihar. Because there are a lot of Bihari migrants in Delhi, in, in, in Haryana. And they transfer money to their families seamlessly. It happens seamlessly, it happens with security, it happens with convenience, even convenience of less educated villagers and villagers' families back home in Bihar. And that is the revolution we are looking, looking to. Let me end by saying that Financial inclusion leads to social inclusion. Financial inclusion is, doesn't per se limit itself just to a financial transaction. I think social inclu inclusion happens. People uh, open up. They get more educated. They get more socially aware of their rights and responsibilities. And finally, uh, we are working with the, the Reserve Bank of India to, to give more flexibility to the relationships of banks and mobile companies. And I'm confident that with the help of uh, telecom ministry will get more flexibility in this area so that we can really have 100% of Indian population backed by the, by the banks of India. Thank you. Thank you. We also have with us John Majaya Sinha. He is the chairman of the Boston Consulting Group for the Asia Pacific and also an expert on financial services. So it's a, it's a privilege uh, and an honor to be here, but what I must remark to all of you is that there is a revolution taking place right now on this podium. I call myself a financial services insider. I chair the CII task force for financial sector reforms. Mm -hmm. And the fact that the Minister of State for Telecommunication is sitting and chairing this session on financial inclusion is extremely noteworthy for everyone who has got any exposure to the Indian financial sector. Any, ex any exposure. So I think there are three big mindset challenges that India faces right now. Each of them is equivalent in size and weight. And I think uh, uh, you know, the, the government will have to decide where it weighs in on each of these. The first is, how do we look at security versus inclusion? You know, the know your customer rules that are there in financial services right now quite clearly and fundamentally inhibit inclusion. The second issue is systemic risk, which is now all the rage given what's happened in other parts of the world and the fact that it has not happened in India, uh, weighs uncomfortably with a widespread of players in the financial sector who are transacting with money. And so this balance between systemic stability and inclusion sometimes go at odds with each other. And then the third is the challenge which comes from a private sector industry and a banking industry which has regulation at its core and in the, all the world now getting stronger. Getting a banking license is not easy, 
and it is there in every country in the world. It's the regulated industry in every country in the world. So whether we see these customers as an opportunity or an obligation varies a lot. I'm sure Mr. Kohli sees it as an opportunity, but how does the financial sector see it? So I s feel that these three issues should form some part of the de deliberations that we have today. Thank you very much. In just a moment, I'm going to open it up to your questions, so please be thinking of some. But uh, I'd first like to ask uh, Minister Pilot, when you have the communications companies who are interested in developing in this market and you also have the financial industry, how do you mediate between these different groups? What role does the government have right now in sorting out the situation when it seems like it's, uh, it's sort of a jump ball in terms of who's going to corner this market? rather too simply, it's not about sorting out anything at all. Actually, it's a question of providing a, a regulatory mechanism which, uh, which really looks after and caters for all the stakeholders. Now, clearly, uh, the objective of the exercise is to have financial inclusion. I think what Mr. Kohli was saying about, about mobile banking is one aspect of it. But it is not, it is not the only way where we're going to target uh, sections of our society that have thus far been excluded. It's been going on in many developing countries. We saw the Kenyan example. Uh, in Philippines, for example, it, it's happening uh, at a much faster rate. Uh, there are many issues in this country where I think a lot of debate and deliberations have to happen, whether it's the central bank, whether it's state governments, whether it's mobile operators, other banks. Um, and you know, there are issues of the quantum of money that can be allowed, and uh, what Mr. Sena said about identity and stuff, security. So it, it's not only a regulated sector, but it also has a lot of other ramifications that one has to be uh, very, very you know, careful in considering as to what the options are. But in terms of what the government has decided to do is to reach out and exp expand our credit base. So what has happened now is that the credit that we were giving from the institutional side to uh, the farming community, for example, has increased seven times in the last four years. So we're trying to pump in the money so that you know, people have access to credit because, like Mr. Kohli said, financial inclusion also, in some sense, helps to a, a social inclusion. So healthcare, Medicare, road, transport, education, all these things are all peripheral once you have the financial inclusion. So we must not think of the mobile handset as the only instrument of changing the, uh, the financial contours that we, we have developed in this country. But I think, for example, in my ministry, we have the Department of Post. We have 155,000 posts. Uh, and about almost 300,000 people working in these post offices. We have 184 million savings banks account just in these post offices. And you know, really, the, the scale and scope of these post offices is, is in every nook and corner of the country. How we can expand those so that they can also be a part of this financial uh, you know, change that we are, we are looking to have. So there are many aspects to it, but we are committed to doing it. I think ICT and IT and mobile phones are certainly a big aspect of it, but perhaps not the only way forward uh, for us to achieve our objectives. Let's ask Mr. Coley, do you have a rollout plan? Where do you see things going in the next five, the next 10 years? How many of your subscribers, what percentage of your subscribers will be sending money over their cell phones? Yes, we do have a rollout plan, but uh, it's not uh, finalized yet. Uh, I think Minister Sir, uh, Pilot gave a very good example of Philippines. Uh, we, we have studied Philippines market very closely. Philippines has not only done a financial for actually send dollars back home to their families, wives, friends uh, through, through the mobile phone. And obviously, mobile phone uh, provides a seamless uh, coverage. We believe that through our pilots, uh, which we have done, we have done many pilots between Delhi, Bihar, Punjab, Bihar, and many other parts of the country, where we have seen it is fully secure transaction. We, we believe that uh, we, as, as a telecom company, are not trying to become a bank. That is not our intention at all, and I want to send this message to all banking community and also RBI. We have no intention of becoming a bank. Our objective is to be a technology enabler. Our objective is, objective is to be a pipeline between the unbanked and the banking system. Because that gap, uh, State Bank of India may have 8,000 branches or 
10,000 branches. I'm sure building more branches will be quite tough and expensive. We are saying don't build more branches, don't build more ATMs. This is the mobile ATM, use it f with full security. All the pilots are showing that this is a secure payment. All the pilots are showing that uh, this is a low cost payment methodology. And I think in the next five years, we could really cover majority of the unbanked in India. Um, Mr. Alana, as the chairman of Habib Bank, do you believe him? Do you see the banks, I mean, so do you see the communications companies as a threat to your business, or do you think now is the time to form partnerships with them? It's a very interesting question. Uh, well, there are two aspects to it, I would say. One is, uh, certainly, I think uh, uh, mobile companies uh, are collaborating with banks in many parts of the world, and uh, that is enabling the banks to reach out much more in terms of their products, in terms of efficiencies, and therefore in, um, in, in their outreach. I think the question is, as, as has just been presented, uh, there is a huge unbanked sector out there, and that is a fact. And uh, I think the challenge is, where does one draw the line? Because when you have a very large unbanked sector, it is important to have the inclusion I mean, that is a given, and I don't think anybody denies that. But there are some aspects which um, have to be examined in, in, a, in a little bit, um, in, in ter slightly more. Uh, there are products that, for example, um, are, are, are products where you do require safety measures and security measures, uh, which have also been mentioned here. So I think as far as collaboration is concerned, I think that is going to move forward. It should move forward. And I think many banks are tying up with cellular companies around the world in trying to, um, in trying to get to their customers uh, a front end which is, which is convenient and which is uh, efficient. But I think, the, as I said, the key issue is going to lie with the unbanked sector. Mm -hmm. What happens there? Um, what happens with the depositors? Um, things of that nature. And I think these are issues which the regulators will have to debate amongst themselves um, because we do see uh, countries moving in different directions. For example, um, in the case of uh, Africa, in the case of Kenya, uh, the central bank has um, the M-PESA product that you just um, showed us. Uh, the M-PESA product is accepted in terms of money transfer and in terms of even foreign remittances, from what I understand. Um, and the central bank has given that permission. But in other countries, the rules are different. Mm -hmm. So I think at some point in time, the regulators will have to sit amongst themselves, because when you get into cross-border transactions, for example, the ones mentioned in the case of Philippines, you have regulators across the borders. How do you deal with them? And how do you deal with the key issues of know your customer, in terms of uh, money laundering, et cetera. I mean, these are issues which are quite live and very serious. So it's going to be a debate that's going to evolve, but I'm very confident that as we move forward, solutions will be found. Mm -hmm. Because there is a void. This void has to be filled. Inclusion is an objective. And therefore, I think the key will be in finding solutions. Mr. Kadir, now we've got large banks, large communications, cellular communications companies that are getting in on the game. This is not going to be a small you know, village pilots that you have going on here. Is there going to still be room for the entrepreneurs? What do entrepreneurs do in terms of helping this evolve? Or is it now, just, or is it now all in the hands of the large corporations and institutions? Uh, I think entrepreneurs are going to play a very important role. Because uh, at the end of the day, um, uh, entrepreneurs live very close to the ground and, and are aware of the problem uh, far closer way than um, um, uh, perhaps the big corporations sometimes um, uh, approach it. But before that, I, will, I want to point, a, uh, point out something important that um, I think uh, Honorable Minister um, pointed that out, um, giving an example of, of post offices. There is, I think it will be difficult for either telephone company or uh, bank 
to, to open up the game completely. We need to create an ecosystem because without that ecosystem, it's impossible. Because even if, even if telephone company pro has all the technology, provides, you know, as, as Mr. Kohli was saying, that it works very efficiently. And efficient it might be, but money could transfer from Haryana to Punjab. But then what do we do with that money? I mean, it is on someone's mobile phone to another, one mobile phone to another mobile phone. So unless there is a mechanism to transfer this thing from, from mobile phone to everyday life, okay, then uh, we are not really uh, solving the problem. Okay? So we need to create an ecosystem that, that at the end of the day, somebody needs to transfer that money from, uh, from, um, from their handset to, to someone's pocket, whether that's a farmer or, or that's, a, um, that's a, a small trader or a large trader. Now, while we are doing all this thing, we're dealing with farmers, we're dealing with large trader, we're, we're dealing with household activities, and there it's impossible to imagine that telephone operators would know how to solve this problem completely. Entrepreneurs will step in, and they will provide different services. Okay? So in some way, these two large industries, uh, telephone and banking, will provide the main frame activities, and entrepreneurs will provide all the all the remaining work. Uh, so they, in, 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 in some way you can see it this way, that they are providing the bird's eye view and the entrepreneurs are providing the worm's eye view and, and solving the problem at the ground. Interesting. Mr. Sinha, I'd like to get your perspective. Is now the time, is mobile banking mature enough for private capital to be invested? And where and how can private and also institutional uh, investors get in on the act right now? Uh, let, let me answer that in a, a slightly bigger context. If you look at India, there are 205 million households. 18 million are what I'd call the first billion. About 91 million households are what I'd call the next billion, earning between 40,000 and 180,000, and 95 million households are below that. So the nature of this opportunity of the, and of that 91 million, which is the next billion, 56 million households are excluded. So, I mean, you can, you can get your orders of magnitude. So the nature of the opportunity is quite disparate. And the, the nature of the solutions cannot be simplistic. The other thing is that we cannot run away from system-wide solutions also. You know, uh, the most celebrated example of inclusion is always the Grameen Bank. But maybe it should be the BRI in Indonesia, which is a public sector bank, which does much more uh, banking to the unbanked than any other. You know? But, you know, these small technology companies trying to come up with solutions because there is not enough opportunity to actually make money, you know, in some parts of this, are not going to create in my mind, I know it sounds sexy, but unfortunately it will not happen. We will need some system-wide level uh, interventions. So if you ask that question, you know, will private money flow in? Yes, you can see uh, private equity firms putting in money into SKS microfinance, you know, which is an MFI. There are 20 MFIs which attract all the glory, okay? And that's good, they're doing a good job. But are they going to change the balance? I don't think so. And we need to accept it. They will not change the balance. You know, we need to understand that this is a sev severe and substantive problem which has to be demystified. The enormity of the challenge has to be appreciated. And then we have to go after it over many decades. In fact, you know, India has no need to be apologetic. It has done a lot. You know, the RBI and all were the pioneers. You know, we've got a cooperative banking system, et cetera, which was, which was there much in advance of many other places. Some of it has worked, some of it has not worked. But it, I mean, we have to view it with some appreciation. But the challenges ahead will not have simple solutions of private entrepreneurs going in and solving the problem. That's not going to happen. Mr. Could you? Yes, please. Yeah. Why don't I avail this opportunity and get some free consulting from BCG? So, I take your point that the uh, SKS type of organizations are not going to be able to deal with the problem holistically. And <clears throat> I think that point is well taken. So we have the government of India, which has RRBs and cooperative banks, et cetera, which is trying to now reach out to the tier three, tier four, tier five cities in smaller villages. But they've been there for three or four, five decades. Now, obviously, we'll need some intervention uh, 
which is besides the microfinance institutions, besides the government and the cooperative banks and the RRBs, the private banks are not going to be going to those smaller cities and towns. Right? So how do you think we need to move forward, keeping in view that we have the te technology available at our disposal? Uh, we have a government that's, that's fully committed to achieving this. How do you see it panning out? Do you think it's going to be more uh, private institutions coming in? So I, I see three very, very great opportunities. The unique identifier hmm. that Mr. Nilkani is taking forward, the mobile phones that are coming in, and there there is a big fight between the, uh, <laughs> you can allow me to say this, Mr. Kohl, between the operators and the uh, instrument, uh, you know, the, the, those who call themselves technology companies and those who call themselves the, the mobile companies and the banks, and also it will cut across different product types. Correct. You know? And it will also not just be restricted to the banks, the insurance companies also have to come in in a, in a, in a fairly mm. uh, big way. The post office is also going to, you know, can energize itself into the kind of role it can play into the future. I, I, I think, Minister, we need to think of this problem with humility. I don't have a solution, but I can tell you that the solution will have four elements to it. It will require us to be able to collaborate across industry verticals as you know the mobile companies are wanting to do with the banks, and I see bank chairmen sitting here are wanting to do with the mobile companies. It will need innovation and the ability by regulation to experiment, which is a big problem in financial services because you need the official permission to experiment because some of these experiments will fail. We have to ensure that the cost of that failure does not create systemic uh, 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 implications. And finally, as we experiment, we'll have to innovate and get on, you know, because every day technology is changing. And it's giving us the kind, you know, uh, the, the, the kind of enormity of, of, uh, of opportunity which we have not been able to foresee in the past, you know. And some of it may co combine in very strange ways. You and I, when we talk of a bank, can imagine a bank. When you talk to a villager, they don't understand what a bank <coughs> means. There is complete lack of incumbency. The vertical is being created as we speak. We did a research for over 26,000 people in India, and some of them saw the bank with that chain as a police station, you know, because the, those are the images that are there. There is complete lack of incumbency. So the, the, the future is being written. It will be written with this technology. It will have to be collaborative because it will not work otherwise. And the kind of industries that might collaborate might go beyond this into pharmaceuticals, into agriculture, you know, in just the same way as we are thinking right now between mobile and banks. What has also happened is that we in India have a, a program, which is the National Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme, which is now by default also <coughs> creating bank accounts for the unbanked. So we have tens and hundreds of millions of people who have, have necessarily got to have a bank account for their money to be transferred to them. And these people had no banking services whatsoever in all of their lives. And now through the post offices in most states, we have a MOU between the Department of Post and the state governments where we redeem the payments from the government of India's, uh, on, on government of India's behalf within five days of them completing the work. So these people are now getting bank accounts, which is, which is now we've allowed, RBI has allowed them to have a zero balance account which is what they don't usually do for a savings account. But we have a zero balance account allowed for the Narega card holders. Once they get a bank account, then we are now pushing into the uh, insurance schemes for them to take use of that. So I think it's, you know, these are all ripple on effects which one had not imagined when we initially started to uh, implement the program. Well, I'd like to take some questions. Uh, but first, oh, Mr. Kadir, do you want to respond to um, Mr. Sinha? I mean, it, do, you, do you, you probably take issue with, with what he's saying well, there, that he seems to be, downplaying the role of the entrepreneur? Uh, well, I mean, I, 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 I also get, um, I, mean, I appreciate the free consulting service here, <laughs> but um, uh, let me put it this way. Uh, I think you recognize the, the intervention that is required very correctly, but I think you, you also underestimate the, the role the entrepreneurs uh, could possibly play. And there's one project that I, I saw very closely, and because you mentioned about Grameen Bank, I'll also give an example um, um, that came in partnership with Grameen Bank, is Grameen Phone. That was a pure, uh, 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 that was an initiative done by entrepreneurs and end up bringing 24 million mobile phones in Bangladesh, a country of 100, uh, actually 25 million. So every, 
every six people in Bangladesh end up having a phone from a from a entrepreneurship that developed out of hundred thousand um, dollar um, initiative. So uh, so entrepreneurs have disruptive way of changing the game, and especially the the area that we are talking about uh, and the number um, we have is the unbanked populations are, are so big. So it's it's quite difficult to to um, foresee right now that exactly how it would be happening. Uh, um, and what role entrepreneurs will play or not. But certainly, I mean, even the small role, even after the big intervention, the small roles are massive. I mean, and I'll, I'll, I'll give my own example. It was, um, we basically uh, created a portal where people are, are, are not even doing the transaction in absence of regulatory regime, but people simply posting their items. Every month, we get $68 million worth of product posted. And those are all used mobile phones, used refrigerator. Uh, it created many kinds of jobs. So, so the, there are, there are, and, and this is just one example we're talking about. And as the transaction opens up, there will be thousands of different kind of services. So I think the impact of, of entrepreneurs would be, would be immense at the end. You forgive me if it. I am celebrating the entrepreneurs. But I'm just saying that we should not believe that they will take care of this problem. Don't you love the way that I'm trying to turn these panelists against one another? I'm doing my best. Let's go to some questions. Enough questions from me. I'm going to make things ugly. Um, you, sir, right there in the front. Um, I can repeat your question. Or, oh, there's a mic coming to you right now. There comes a mic. Uh, thank you very much. I'm Satish Garotra. Uh, you know, in spite of all the precautions taken by the various banks in the country, so many frauds are taking place. White collar frauds are very, very common in spite of all the precautions. I, my question is to Mr. Kohli, what step you propose to take to check up such frauds in the banking transaction by mobile? A. B. The present Banking and Regulation Act of the RBI 1954 does not provide very enough legal steps to safeguard the depositor or the uh, client. Um, I, uh, will you like to elaborate on these two points? Because you see, the fraud in India, other day I read in the newspaper, somebody even kidnapped a full ATM machine itself. To, took away. So we are very, we are very, we are very update in committing fraud in the banking transaction. Would you like to tell us what precautions you propose to take? If you don't take adequate care, they will happen. But if you take care, which we are trying to take, uh, we, as, as, as I described the pilots which we are doing with, uh, with various states of India, these pilots are uh, banked pilot, by the way. The person on this side who is sending money, he, we open a State Bank of India account. It's not Bharti Airtel account, it's a State Bank of India account. And the person on the other side is also a State Bank of India bank account holder. So both sides, we open brand new accounts. We also ensure that the last mile, and uh, GSM technology is the best technology, most secure technology in the world. And now we are moving over to 3G next year, so that is more secure than this. We ensure that it's fully secure. The, the codes which we gave, the, the, the secret uh, you know, uh, numbers which we gave, are only available with that person who has a bank account. Now, obviously, if that person is, is, is casual or careless, uh, it, could, it could lead to some fraud. Uh, that, but that can happen to any bank account. That can happen to any, any service where, where financial flows are involved. So I can, I can assure you that technology is very secure. Now we have to get the, the, the process framework which is as secure as possible. And that's what the pilots are trying to do. Mr. Coley and Mr. Lana, if I may follow up, let me ask you this. How many total transactions have occurred in your, with your institutions, and has there been any fraud? Can you say there's been no fraud to date with these mobile banking transactions? Let me, let me give you a, a dimension of what we do. Out of 115 million customers we have, more than 100 million are prepaid customers. We recharge about six billion rupees, uh, six billion dollars a year, which means every day there are millions and millions of recharges happening. All are financial transactions, but all are transactions within ADA. They are not outside, and they are all secure. We do not get any 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 fraud uh, incidents in, in at least this uh, this process. However, as the process you know, embraces many more millions, there will be some propensity for fraud, and I think we need to control that proactively. 
There must be some clever people out there who are coming up with schemes now to uh, monopolize on this. Um, and also, you know, have you seen any instances of fraud to date? Um, you know, in terms of the mobile banking, I think um, I think we need to be we need to understand um, that. And I I actually make a very clear distinction between the two. One is where you have clients who have bank accounts, such as the ones just mentioned, for example, at both the ends, where the mobile phone simply becomes um, a handheld ATM machine, enabling the customer to transact from one account to the other account, which is, uh, which is similar to the risks that you would have, for example, in, in an ATM setup, I would imagine. The other set, is where the customers do not have bank accounts, where the money is transferred from one mobile phone to the other mobile phone, or the money is in cash at the other end, or what is also being termed as virtual banking. That I am I'm not very sure of, because I think there is not enough out there at this point in time, at least I haven't seen any numbers coming up, because the industry um, as I said, there are only a handful of examples where this is happening. Uh, Kenya, I know one where this model is working with Safaricom and Vodafone. And I know that it works in Afghanistan with uh, Roshan and Vodafone. Um, but I'm not aware of any other situations where this is happening on a large scale. I think both these models are quite new. They have recently come into force. For example, Safaricom only started in 2007. So I, I don't have access to any credible data to suggest that uh, there are signs of frauds. But like any other transaction, for example, uh, uh, it, it I mean, frauds have happened, are happening, and will happen. I mean, that is the way life is. Um, but it's going to be interesting to see how this industry evolves. And I think that's where, as I mentioned earlier, I think the regulators will have to also step in at some point in time, because where you have transactions occurring between two individuals who do not have bank accounts, for example, that's where lies the greatest risk. And I think that's where the regulators uh, have not been able to come to, a, um, come to a consensus as to how that segment of the mobile banking will work. Mr. Mr. Pyle, let me um, ask you this. I mean, the government's gonna have access potentially to oceans of data from these transactions. The government will be able to see how people are spending their money, how, who's sending money to whom. That's the potential future we're looking at. What are the implications of that for the government? Do you see that as, I mean, there, there's probably some concerns from, from people out there that they're gonna be watched more closely. But I think it's, uh, there's nothing wrong if the government looks at who's sending who, how much money. Uh, I don't think anybody should have a problem with that. Uh, and that's traditionally been the case. I think the problem arises when uh, the, the transactions are done outside the banking sector. And that's where people don't want the government to see what they're doing. But as long as the transactions are either online or through a mobile phone or through the banks, uh, I think it's, it's quite all right for the government to uh, know who's transacting how much uh, and who to. That's not a problem. I think the problem that he mentioned is actually quite pertinent, uh, is the fact that you will then allow um, a larger section of the money, which is unaccounted for, to perhaps then penetrate the uh, official uh, transactions that are happening in this country or in other parts of the world. Uh, again, th there are perhaps some legal problems to that. Um, and I think there are other parameters and other frameworks that are yet to be evolved for us to go and say that you know, the mobile banking is uh, one and only way of having financial inclusion. That's my personal view, not as someone who's sharing the meat uh, in terms of financial inclusion. I still remain the minister in the IT and telecom. So, um, uh, But I think that's a decision the government will have to take after due consultations and considerations. But just one last point I want to make is that we shouldn't actually, even when we discuss and ask questions, we should think a little bit more broadly on, on what the issue is. The issue is not whether mobile phone can be used for banking. Sure, in the near future sometime it will be. Idea is how in this country where we have millions of people who have no access to banking and credit services and financial services, how can we get them into the mainstream? I think that's the thrust of the discussion. So with all due respect to Mr. Kohli, this not really is a mobile transaction uh, 
discussion. This is really a bit larger than that, but that certainly is a big part of it. So let me let me <coughs> clarify. Uh, just to just to, there are two two social issues which we have to tackle, <coughs> and I'm not coming from a mobile industry viewpoint. One that 50 percent, more than 50 percent of Indian economy is cash economy, and that needs to go to bank economy over a period of time, which is very important. Second is if government spends 100 rupees on government schemes, X percentage of that, which is a small percentage, reaches the final final uh, beneficiary. I think both these problems will, if they're addressed, they will lead to much faster economic development of the country. The third thing I want to clarify is when I said banking, banked guy on this side, a banked guy on this side, actually I didn't mean that they're old bank account holders. We open fresh bank accounts there and then. A person who comes to us and says that I don't have a bank account, we say fine, we will help you open the bank account. On the other side, if it's his wife, we say, fine, we'll help. Our, our office at that place will help you open a bank account on the other side also. Because we are not becoming a bank. We are helping the bank to reach out. That is the purpose. Purpose is just to be an enabler, nothing more than that. Yes, sir, in the back. Can you do that for people who don't have a mobiles? Will you still do that for them? <laughs> so you've got to have an Airtel mobile for you to do that service for them. See, the idea is for us to have people open bank accounts. Whether one operator does it, whether the government does it, or the NGO does it, I think it's, it has to be a collaborative effort. Yes, sir, in the back. Uh, my name is Arun Dugal. I'm chairman of Bellwether Microfinance Fund. Uh, uh, first, a comment about uh, M-Pesa. Uh, it is uh, judged that uh, a major factor for success of that uh, service in Kenya is that there is one single dominant mobile service provider there. So both receiver and sender, in all probability, will be using the same uh, operator, which is Vodafone there. In India, situation is quite different. There are a number of uh, uh, operators, and even though uh, Airtel is the leading operator, my suggestion would be that uh, <coughs> perhaps it's time to form some kind of uh, collaboration between the operators so that there is a central switch, like it is in the ATMs, where money can be directed to uh, the other party who may not be on the sa using the same operator. Secondly, I'd like to talk about uh, two issues affecting microfinance industry. If I may interrupt you, I think that's an interesting question you raised. Can, I'm gonna take that to the panel. Um, who would like to field that question? Well, on, on, on M-Pesa, I can respond to you on the M-Pesa because I, we, we've looked at that very, very carefully. We also have a bank in, uh, in Kenya, which we are looking to see how we can work this uh, system out. Uh, they are now offering uh, interconnectivity between the, between the various networks over there. So that has happened. So it does go from one account to the other account. But again, the key is uh, on both sides of the spectrum, uh, individuals don't have to have bank accounts. That is the premises on which they are working, for example. Uh, whereas um, our premises or the central bank premises in most of the markets, markets are, you can facilitate the money transfer as long as both sides have bank accounts. I think that is where the differentials lie. Uh, why don't you continue on with your question, your second question. Uh, uh, question is the in uh, microfinance industry cost structure, at the moment, about 10% of the operating costs, 10% uh, of the cost is operating costs, the cost of delivering and collecting money. Uh, that if you add that to 13, 14%, the cost of funds, a little bit of credit losses, the, there is no way microfinance industry can deliver credit to uh, our borrowers at less than 24, 25%, which is very high. The one uh, area, the lowest hanging fruit here is if that operating cost can be reduced from 10% to what is in the bank's 2-3% operating cost. And uh, to me, it looks like that the mobile uh, industry, uh, mobile banking industry sh should take a lead there and come up with mechanism to reduce that operating cost using mobile uh, facilities. And the last point relating to uh, microfinances. Uh, 
to interrupt you. I'm going to have to move to some other questions. And I'd like to ask Mr. Kadir if you'd like to respond to that last part. What role does the entrepreneur have to play? Uh, uh, before uh, going to the entrepreneurial role, I could um, share a little research we have done um, on the point you raised. Uh, microfinance, um, uh, yes, the operating cost is very high, but the core reason that microfinance succeeds all, the, uh, succeeds all the time, or most of the time, is because the, the money collector and the borrower, the person-to-person -person, uh, relationship they have, and that might make it more expensive operational cost-wise, but if, if you take that away and make it a mechanical system like mobile money, uh, that may have a had negative impact on the, the whole idea of microfinance and how it works currently. So um, um, even if um, uh, mobile money is applied in microfinance, it, it may take some time. Um, that's what uh, most of the people who are working in this field, that's what they feel. All right. I'd like to go to our next question over here. My name is Sanjeev Bajaj, and I'm part of the Bajaj Group. And amongst our businesses, other than motorcycles, is also consumer lending, distribution, and insurance. My question is to Mr. Pilot, because you referred to an existing network of uh, the rural banks, the co-ops, the post offices. Um, and that's a huge network all across the country. We also know that it's not the most efficient network. And I have enough examples, but I won't waste time on that. Uh, this will require a significant amount of effort and investment to really enable this network to cater to uh, people in rural India. What, do you think the government would be open to uh, the right kind of private partnership to enable some of these networks? Well, I personally believe that uh, the infrastructure we have created in the last six decades uh, is perhaps not sufficient for us to have the kind of reach uh, that we aspire for in terms of rural credit and financial and banking services, as well as insurance services. Now, what kind of collaboration it will be? Uh, will it be a joint venture? Will it be just investment? Will there be technology? Um, I think that discussion is still on. Uh, but to my mind, uh, linking up various points on the chart so as to achieve uh, what is in the best interest of this nation, uh, I think we are all are committed to that. Uh, I don't want to go into specifics or as to which sector and which company, foreign, Indian, or whatever. Uh, but I think there has been an effort and, uh, and a lot of effort in the cooperative sector, in the RRBs, and even in the lending sector. The government of India has earmarked X amount, I think almost 30 to 40 percent, which is called the priority lending. That money has to go to people and institutions and areas that are really, really deprived of and, and starved of, of finances. And there are private money lenders who are lending at 5 percent a month. I mean, that's killing a large part of our uh, agricultural population, literally. So we're really trying to make sure that, that, that we are we're the buffer for that. So we're putting all efforts, state governments as well as central government, and I'm happy uh, to explore further options, but I don't want to commit on specifics as to sector and companies. All right. Next question, I'll go to you, sir, over here. My name is Neera Jagarwal. I'm a partner with BCG. I follow this uh, space very closely. And one thing which intrigues me a lot is the two examples which get talked about all the time are Philippines and Kenya. Yeah, I mean, if you look around the world, there are many places which has this need. Philippines and Kenya stand out. Uh, in my observation, one thing stands out about those two countries. Uh, in one of the places, there's one entity which has both a telecom and a banking license. In another place, uh, you know, because of a, a you know, majority telecom presence that they have, they also have, through a complicated structure, access to banking. Uh, so, you know, it's strange that these two countries really stand out in a world where many other places' uh, needs have been. So is it really about, not so much about technology, is it really about collaboration between two different worlds, which have in the past not really come together, and they need to figure out how they need to join hands, uh, because there are profit pools involved, there are interests involved, and that makes it more complex rather than anything else. That's it. I mean, broader question to the panel. Take that question. Actually, it's a very uh, good point you're raising. I believe that without collaboration, this won't happen. And you're right. In Philippines, Ayala Group uh, has a bank, and Globe Telecom is part of the same group. So it, it, it I'm sure, it happened very fast. And similarly in Kenya. I think uh, I was just talking to uh, the minister that if, if we really get a collaborative uh, team together, which, which consists of 
Ministry of Finance, Telecom, Post Offices, because all of us have to do it together. It can't be done by one company or one bank, because the, the opportunity is so- make, it th make things ugly. Um, you, sir, right there in the front. Um, I can repeat your question, or oh, there's a mic coming to you right now. There comes a mic. Uh, thank you very much. I'm Satish Garotra. Uh, you know, in spite of all the precautions taken by the various banks in the country, so many frauds are taking place. White collar frauds are very, very common in spite of all the precautions. I, my question is to Mr. Kohli, what step you propose to take to check up such frauds in the banking transaction by mobile? A. B. The present Banking Regulation Act of the RBI 1954 does not provide very enough legal steps to safeguard the depositor or the uh, client. Um, I, uh, will you like to elaborate on these two points? Because you see the fraud in India, other day I read in newspaper, somebody even kidnapped a full ATM machine itself, to, took away. <laughs> so we are, very, we, are very, we are very update in committing fraud in the banking transaction. Would you like to tell us what precautions you propose to take? If you don't take adequate care, they will happen. But if you take care, which we are trying to take, uh, we, as, as, as I described the pilots which we are doing with, uh, with various states of India, these pilots are uh, banked pilots, by the way. The person on this side who is sending money, he, we open a State Bank of India account. It's not Bharti Airtel account, it's a State Bank of India account. And the person on the other side is also a State Bank of India bank account holder. So both sides, we open brand new accounts. We also ensure that the last mile, and GSM technology is the best technology, most secure technology in the world, and now we are moving over to 3G next year, so that is more secure than this. We ensure that it's fully secure. The, the codes which we gave, the, the, the secret uh, you know, uh, numbers which we gave are only available with that person who has a bank account. Now obviously if that person is, is, is casual or careless, uh, it, could, it could lead to some fraud. Uh, that, but that can happen to any bank account. That can happen to any, any service where, where financial flows are involved. So I can, I can assure you that technology is very secure. Now we have to get the, the, the process framework, which is as secure as possible. And that's what the pilots are trying to do. Mr. Coley and Mr. Lana, if I may follow up, let me ask you this. How many total transactions have occurred in your, with your institutions? And has there been any fraud? Can you say there's been no fraud to date? with these mobile banking transactions? Let me, let me give you a, a dimension of what we do. Out of 115 million customers we have, more than 100 million are prepaid customers. We recharge about six billion rupees, uh, six billion dollars a year, which means every day there are millions and millions of recharges happening. All are financial transactions, but all are transactions within ADA. They're not outside, and they're all secure. We do not get any, any, any fraud uh, incidents in, in at least this, uh, this process. However, as the process uh, you know, embraces many more millions, there will be some propensity for fraud, and I think we need to control that proactively. And Mr. Lanza, there must be some clever people out there who are coming up with schemes now to uh, monopolize on this. Um, and also, you know, have you seen any instances of fraud to date? Um, you know, in terms of the mobile banking, I think um, I think we need to be we need to understand um, that. And I I actually make a very clear distinction between the two. One is where you have clients who have bank accounts, such as the ones just mentioned, for example, at both the ends, where the mobile phone simply becomes. Um, a handheld ATM machine enabling the customer to transact from one account to the other account, which is, uh, which is similar to the risks that you would have, for example, in, in an ATM setup, I would imagine. The other set is where the customers do not have bank accounts, where the money is transferred from one mobile phone to the other mobile phone or the money is in cash at the other end, or what is also being termed as virtual banking. That I am, I'm not very sure of, because I think there is not enough out there at this point in time, 
least I haven't seen any numbers coming up because the industry, um, as I said, there are only a handful of examples where this is happening. Uh, Kenya, I know one where this model is working with Safaricom and Vodafone. And I know that it works in Afghanistan with uh, Roshan and Vodafone. Um, but I'm not aware of any other situations where this is happening on a large scale. I think both these models are quite new. They have recently come into force. For example, Safaricom only started in 2007. So I, I don't have access to any credible data to suggest that uh, there are signs of frauds. But like any other transaction, for example, uh, uh, it, it happened, I mean, frauds have happened, are happening, and will happen. I mean, that is the way life is. Um, but it's going to be interesting to see how this industry evolves. And I think that's where, as I mentioned earlier, I think the regulators will have to also step in at some point in time, because where you have transactions occurring between two individuals who do not have bank accounts, for example, that's where lies the greatest risk. And I think that's where the regulators uh, have not been able to come to, a, um, come to a consensus as to how that segment of the mobile banking will work. Mr. Mr. Pyle, let me um, ask you this. I mean, the government's going to have access potentially to oceans of data from these transactions. The government will be able to see how people are spending their money, how, who's sending money to whom. That's the potential future we're looking at. What are the implications of that for the government? Do you see that as, I mean, there, there's probably some concerns from, from people out there that they're going to be watched more closely. Well, I think it's, uh, there's nothing wrong if the government looks at who's sending who how much money. Uh, I don't think anybody should have a problem with that. Uh, and that's traditionally been the case. I think the problem arises when uh, the, the transactions are done outside the banking sector. And that's where people don't want the government to see what they're doing. But as long as the transactions are either online or through a mobile phone or through the banks, uh, I think it's, it's quite all right for the government to uh, know who's transacting how much uh, and who to. That's not a problem. I think the problem that he mentioned is actually quite pertinent, uh, is the fact that you will then allow um, a larger section of the money, which is unaccounted for, to perhaps then penetrate the uh, official transactions that are happening in this country or in other kind of parts of the world. Uh, again, th there are perhaps some legal problems to that. Um, and I think there are other parameters and other frameworks that are yet to be evolved for us to go and say that you know, the mobile banking is uh, one and only way of having financial inclusion. That's my personal view, not as someone who's chairing the meet uh, in terms of financial inclusion. I still remain the minister in the IT and telecom. So. Um, uh, but I think that's a decision the government will have to take after due consultations and considerations. But just one last point I want to make is that we shouldn't actually, even when we discuss and ask questions, we should think a little bit more broadly on, on what the issue is. The issue is not whether mobile phone can be used for banking. Sure, in the near future sometime it will be. The idea is how in this country where we have millions of people who have no access to banking and credit services and financial services, how can we get them into the mainstream? I think that's the thrust of the discussion. So with all due respect to Mr. Kohli, this not really is a mobile transaction uh, discussion. This is really a bit larger than that. But that certainly is a big part of it. So let me, let me <coughs> clarify that. Uh, just to, just to, there are two, two social issues which we have to tackle. <coughs> and I'm not coming from a mobile industry viewpoint. One, that 50 percent, more than 50 percent of Indian economy is cash economy. And that needs to go to bank economy over a period of time, which is very important. Second is, if government spends 100 rupees on government schemes, X percentage of that, which is a small percentage, reaches the final, final uh, beneficiary. I think both these problems will, if they're addressed, they will lead to much faster economic development of the country. The third thing I want to clarify is when I said banking, banked guy on this side, a banked guy on this side, actually I didn't mean that they're old bank account holders. We open fresh bank accounts there and then. A person who comes to us and says that I don't have a bank account, we say fine. We will help you open the bank account. On the other side, if it's his wife, we say, fine, we'll help. Our, our office at that place will help you open a bank account on the other side also. Because we are not becoming a bank. We are helping the bank to reach out. That is the purpose. Purpose is just to be an enabler, nothing more than that. Yes, sir, in the back. Can you do that for people who don't have a mobiles? Will you still do that for them? <laughs> 
So you've got to have an Airtel mobile for you to do that service for them. So the idea is for us to have people open bank accounts, whether one operator does it, whether the government does it, or the NGO does it. I think it's, it has to be a collaborative effort. Yes, sir, the, in the back. Uh, my name is Arun Dugal. I'm chairman of Bellwether Microfinance Fund. Uh, uh, first, a comment about uh, M-Pesa. Uh, it is uh, judged that uh, a major factor for success of that uh, service in Kenya is that there is one single dominant mobile service provider there. So both receiver and sender, in all probability, will be using the same uh, operator, which is Vodafone there. In India, situation is quite different. There are a number of uh, uh, operators, and even though uh, Airtel is the leading operator, my suggestion would be that uh, <coughs> perhaps it's time to form some kind of uh, collaboration between the operators so that there is a central switch, like it is in the ATMs, where money can be directed to uh, the other party who may not be on the sa using the same operator. Secondly, I'd like to talk about uh, two issues affecting microfinance industry. If I may interrupt you, I think that's an interesting question you raised. Can, I'm going to take that to the panel. Um, who would like to field that question? Well, on, on, on M-Pesa, I can respond to you on the M-Pesa because I, we, we've looked at that very, very carefully. We also have a bank in, uh, in Kenya, which we're looking to see how we can work this uh, system out. Uh, they are now offering uh, interconnectivity between the, between the various networks over there. So that has happened. So it does go from one account to the other account. But again, the key is uh, on both sides of the spectrum, uh, individuals don't have to have bank accounts. That is the premises on which they are working, for example. Uh, whereas um, our premises or the central bank premises in most of the markets, markets are, you can facilitate the money transfer as long as both sides have bank accounts. I think that is where the differentials lie. Um, why don't you continue on with your question, your second question. Um, uh, in uh, microfinance industry cost structure, at the moment, about 10% of the operating cost, 10% uh, of the cost is operating costs, the cost of delivering and collecting money. Uh, that, if you add that to 13, 14%, the cost of funds, a little bit of credit losses, the, there is no way microfinance industry can deliver credit to uh, our borrowers at less than 24, 25%, which is very high. The one uh, area, the lowest hanging fruit here is if that operating cost can be reduced from 10% to what is in the bank's 2 3% operating cost. And uh, to me, it looks like that the mobile uh, industry, uh, mobile banking industry sh should take a lead there and come up with mechanism to reduce that operating cost using mobile uh, facilities. And the last point relating to uh, microfinance is... I'm going to interrupt you. I'm going to have to move to some other questions. And I'd like to ask Mr. Kadir if you'd like to respond to that last part. What role does the entrepreneur have to play? Uh, uh, before uh, going to the entrepreneurial role, I could um, share a little research we have done um, on the point you raised. Uh, microfinance, um, uh, yes, the operating cost is very high, but the core reason that microfinance succeeds all, the, uh, succeeds all the time, or most of the time, is because the, the money collector and the borrower, the person-to-person -person, uh, relationship they have, and that might make it more expensive operational cost-wise, but if, if you take that away and make it a mechanical system like mobile money, uh, that may have a have negative impact on the, the whole idea of microfinance and how it works currently. So um, um, even if um, uh, mobile money is applied in microfinance, it, it may take some time. Um, that's what uh, most of the people who are working in this field, that's what they feel. All right. I'd like to go to our next question over here. My name is Sanjeev Bajaj, and I'm part of the Bajaj Group. And amongst our businesses, other than motorcycles, is also consumer lending, distribution, and insurance. 
My question is to Mr. Pilot, because you referred to an existing network of uh, the rural banks, the co-ops, the post offices. Um, and that's a huge network all across the country. We also know that it's not the most efficient network. And I have enough examples, but I won't waste time on that. Uh, this will require a significant amount of effort and investment to really enable this network to cater to uh, people in rural India. What, do you think the government would be open to uh, the right kind of private partnership to enable some of these networks? Well, I personally believe that uh, the infrastructure we have created in the last six decades uh, is perhaps not sufficient for us to have the kind of reach uh, that we aspire for in terms of rural credit and financial and banking services, as well as insurance services. Now, what kind of a collaboration it will be? Uh, will it be a joint venture? Will it be just investment? Will there be technology? Um, I think that discussion is still on. Uh, but to my mind, uh, linking up various points on the chart so as to achieve uh, what is in the best interest of this nation, I think we all are committed to that. Uh, I don't want to go into specifics as to which sector and which company, foreign, Indian, or whatever. Uh, but I think there has been an effort and, uh, and a lot of effort in the cooperative sector, in the RRBs, and even in the lending sector. The government of India has earmarked X amount, I think almost 30 to 40 percent, which is called the priority lending. That money has to go to people and institutions and areas that are really, really deprived of and, and starved of, of finances. And there are private money lenders who are lending at 5 percent a month. I mean, that's killing a large part of our uh, agricultural population, literally. So we're really trying to make sure that that, that we are, we are the buffer for that. So we are putting all efforts, state governments as well as central government, and I'm happy uh, to explore further options, but I don't want to commit to specifics as to sector and companies. All right. Next question, I'll go to you, sir, over here. Uh, my name is Neera Jagarwal. I'm a partner with BCG. I follow this uh, space very closely, and one thing which intrigues me a lot is the two examples which get talked about all the time are Philippines and Kenya. Yeah, I mean, if you look around the world, there are many places which has this need. Philippines and Kenya stand out. Uh, in my observation, one thing stands out about those two countries. Uh, in one of the places, there's one entity which has both a telecom and a banking license. In another place, uh, you know, because of a, a you know, majority telecom presence that they have, they also have, through a complicated structure, access to banking. Uh, so, you know, it's strange that these two countries really stand out in a world where many other places' uh, needs have been. So is it really about, not so much about technology, is it really about collaboration between two different worlds, which have in the past not really come together, and they need to figure out how they need to join hands, uh, because there are profit pools involved, there are interests involved, and that makes it more complex rather than anything else. That's a I mean, broader question to the panel. Actually, it's a very uh, good point you're raising. I believe that Without collaboration, this won't happen. And you're right. In Philippines, Ayala Group uh, has a bank, and Globe Telecom is part of the same group. So it, it, it I'm sure, it happened very fast. And similarly in Kenya. I think uh, I was just talking to uh, the minister that if, if we really get a collaborative uh, team together, which, which consists of uh, Ministry of Finance, Telecom, post offices, because all of us have to do it together. It can't be done by one company or one bank because of the